I am excited to present our speaker for today. Um, this session is being hosted by the Women of Waymo and the Women of X community. So very excited that this has been brought together in such a short period of time. And Ijima Olu was able to meet with us and speak with us about her work on the book that she has written, a bestseller, no doubt. Um, and one that I'm sure if you haven't read it, you will read it and probably refer to it over and over again as I have. Ijima Olu, am I saying that right? Ijima. Ijoma. Ijoma. Mm -hmm. Of course I messed it up. Ijoma <laughs> Olu is a Seattle-based writer, speaker, and internet yeller. That is my favorite title in the world. <laughs> She's the author of the New York Times bestseller, So You Want to Talk About Race, which was published in January by Silk Press. Named one of the Roots 100 Most Influential African Americans in 2017, and I would probably argue one of the 100 Most Influential Americans of 2017 and 2020. One of the Most Influential People in Seattle by Seattle Magazine. One of the 50 Most Influential Women in Seattle by Seattle Met, and winner of the 2018 Feminist Humanist Award by the American Humanist Society. Olu's work focuses primarily on issues of race and identity, feminism, social and mental health, social justice, the arts, personal essay. Her writing has been featured in The Washington Post, New NBC News, Elle Magazine, Time, The Stranger, The Guardian, other outlets, and now she's here with us. Really excited. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. Um, it's a pleasure to talk with everyone today. And I guess I, I first wanted to start with a little bit more of an introduction of who I am as far as in my relationship and my history in writing and speaking about issues of race and identity in America. So I have always loved writing and I've loved it since I was a child, but it was definitely something that I never considered would be a career. I, like many other people who grew up in the Seattle area, went into tech. And I, that was kind of the thing that you did, especially if you grew up in the 80s and 90s. Um, it, was, it was the place to be. I was, you know, I grew up very poor, as many Black people in the Pacific Northwest um, and the, across the country can relate to. And so for me, my goal was definitely to find a career that would pay the bills, that would make sure that my family was secure. I worked in tech for probably about a decade before I started writing professionally. And I can honestly say I probably wouldn't have started writing had I not worked in tech. There is a, a special environment in tech that can be incredibly gaslighting if you are a person of color and especially a black person in that space. Tech is often an overwhelmingly white male space that also claims to have a very liberal ideology. It's also a place that likes to pretend that it is beyond issues of race and identity, that all that matters really are your skills and your love of technology. But race is in absolutely everything we do. I've said this before and I'll say it again. There is absolutely no way that you can found a country on the genocide of one group of color and the forced enslavement of another group of color and think that anything built in that soil will not have something to do with race. And so in an environment where you're an extreme minority and where in an environment where you find yourself consistently being treated differently and yet no one wants to admit that you are being treated differently or that there are any issues, can be very difficult. Specifically, I started writing around the time that Trayvon Martin was killed. I am a single mother, a black single mother. And in Trayvon, I saw my son, I saw my brother, and I was incredibly traumatized by what was happening. Adding to that trauma was the fact that the people around me, in my neighborhoods, in my friend groups, and in my workplace were incredibly silent. This was before everyone was shouting that Black Lives Matter. This was a time where even in a liberal workspace that would want to stage a protest if people weren't recycling, people still didn't feel comfortable talking about issues of race. I grew up in the Seattle area. I grew up in this proudly liberal, politically engaged area. 
And it was heartbreaking and confusing to find myself suddenly in a space where the people who said that they loved me and understood me didn't want to talk about one of the most important factors in my life. It felt like I had fallen through a veil into an alternate reality where I was being drastically impacted by these events and everyone else around me was walking around like things were just fine. I started writing because I needed it to make sense. I started writing because I needed to know that there was a way that the people that I loved and people who said they loved me could understand why this mattered and why they needed to engage on these issues. I started writing because I needed to know that I wasn't insane. So it really kind of started out just with Facebook posts, tweet threads. I had a food blog, which by the way, if you ever want to get free food, make a food blog. It doesn't even, no one has to read it. It's just, if you have it, people will give you free food. It's really cool. But anyways, I started repurposing my food blog to just talk about race. And I, at the time, had no intention of being a writer. My goal was really to try to find a way to explain why this mattered to the people in my life that I cared about. I kept thinking, okay, if I just explain like my experiences with this issue, if I explain the times that I interacted with police, if I explain how this makes me feel, maybe these people that I love and who say they love me will see why they need to care. I would love to say that that was the immediate response, but it was not. I pretty quickly lost the vast majority of my friends. Pretty quickly people at the office were afraid to talk to me. But almost as quickly, other people started coming forward. First, it was other people of color, especially other black people in the Seattle area, other people in similar environments to tech saying, I thought I was the only one. I thought I was going crazy. It's so, so glad to know I'm not. And then eventually other white people started reaching out and white people started saying, I didn't realize this was such a big deal. Thank you for explaining this. And then I started getting calls and emails from newspaper outlets and television news shows saying, we saw this tweet you made do you, you want to speak with us about this? And I was so surprised and I was still working in an environment where I didn't feel safe talking about these issues. I remember literally going and hiding in my car to have a discussion with New York Magazine about the killing of Michael Brown because I knew that my work environment was not a place where I could safely discuss this, even though I had spent all day trying not to cry. I had spent multiple days trying not to cry. Eventually, after quite a while of living these kind of two realities, where one space where my voice was heard and appreciated, where I could enter a room as a whole black woman and live my truth, and then another space where I felt like I had to consistently be quieter, apologetic for who I am, I decided I couldn't live like that anymore. And I quit my job and dedicated myself to writing full time. The rest is kind of history. It was some struggle for a while, some definite hustle for a while. And I, I definitely think that growing up poor helped me prepare me for what it is like to be a freelance writer because it is not immediate um, wealth and success that you find in that world. But eventually I was able to build a career writing and speaking on these issues that mean so much to me. It's definitely a double-edged sword. The truth is, is that I don't know any people of color, especially not black like people in this country, who enjoy talking about issues of race and racism. It is incredibly painful for us to talk about harm that has been done and is being done to us. It is incredibly risky to talk about these issues. And the truth is, is that 80, 90% of the time, it doesn't pay off. The majority of the time, we are met with hostility and defensiveness. The majority of the time, we find that the people we've reached out to aren't there for us and really don't care in the way that we hope they would. And yet we keep trying. 
We have to keep trying because our lives are on the line. And because we love ourselves and we love community, and yes, we love the white people that we are reaching out to, we keep working at this. And so it is so important that we take every opportunity when people of color are talking about what they're facing to engage, to be appreciative, and to respect that serious effort. So because of my history working in tech, I am called into a lot of tech spaces. <laughs> and I think that oftentimes when um, experts and speakers on issues of race and identity are brought in, they oftentimes do not know the nuances of what happens in tech environments, but I do. Now, I know that tech moves fast. I know that as far as the technology goes, a lot has changed in the time since I left the tech fields, but I have seen time and time again in the dozens of environments that I have been in, in the dozens, hundreds of conversations I've had with people of color in the tech field, I have absolutely seen patterns of what is keeping people from moving forward in racial justice. The truth is, is that there is racism in tech. It is in the work environment. It is in the financial decisions that companies make. It is in the hiring decisions that companies make. It is in the pipeline that feeds employees into the tech field. And it is in the products that tech companies make. This matters for a lot of really important reasons. It matters because right now you could be harming employees, coworkers, and partners of color. Right now, if you aren't hearing actively, regularly about the issues of race that your company is facing, it is because the people of color in your midst have decided that you are not safe. They have decided it is not worth the risk. And that is a serious problem. You impact the local economies wherever you do business. Even if the majority of your employees work remote, you're still impacting local economies in a way that will reflect the racial bias of your company makeup. You make products that shape culture. And this is something that is incredibly unique to tech and to media. You are not only making products that people use and people engage with. You are making products that set norms, that tell people who is valued and who is not, that tell people how they should come together and how they should not. You also make products, and this is tech in general, that can easily be co-opted and used to aid and violate white supremacy. And we have seen this with products that have been made by many of our tech giants. We have seen how easily power structures have come in and either used the example of the technology or the technology itself in order to aid in the violent crackdown of populations of color. So now that I have established that this is important and this matters, let's talk about how we can remove some barriers that stop tech from doing some real anti-racist work. One, you have to dismantle the white male mythology of tech history. And this is something that I think that a lot of people who aren't the beneficiaries of this mythology don't understand. But there is an absolute harmful tale of how tech has started and why people are in tech that oftentimes follows the story of white men who were ignored, who were outcasts, who built themselves up just out of a dream and their love for technology and created these spaces where anything is possible, where everyone is free. It is important first and foremost that we recognize that the story behind much of our tech is steeped in financial privilege, racial privilege, and gender privilege. It is also important to recognize that the barriers that have been removed in tech were removed in a white male image. These were the barriers that white men often felt kept them from acting freely, 
with little consideration to the barriers that kept women, non-male people, and people of color from being able to operate freely in tech spaces. It is important that we understand that because there is an entitlement that comes with that mythology that often sees women and people of color as threats. It is important that we recognize this because that mythology shapes our rules and our goals for what truly freedom in tech really means. It is important that you take an honest accounting of where you are at. It is important that you look around and say, who is here and who is not? Who gets promoted and who does not? Who have we served with our products and who have we not? Are we a trusted partner of communities of color? While it's easy for many people to say that racism lies in the hearts and minds of individuals, the truth is, is that we will see the results of racism in our statistics and our numbers. You will see it in your retention rates, your promotion rates, your hiring rates. You will see it in your advertising platforms, in your partnerships. It is important to do an honest and open accounting of where you are at. Tip three, treat racial justice like your money. And this is something I tell pretty much any corporation that I speak to. I don't know any company that doesn't have some sort of equity or racial justice statement in their mission, in their goals, in their big you know, HR onboarding meetings. And yet time and time again, I find that there is a vast difference in the ways in which companies treat their equity goals, and their financial goals. When it impacts your money, you will create measurable goals. When it impacts your money, you will have accountability. When it impacts your money, you know that you cannot survive without meeting your goals. We do not treat racial equity the same way, and we must. It is important that we actually show that equity is more important than money. It is important that you recognize that you cannot survive without racial equity, not financially, not ethically. Value your employees and partners of color because they are people of color. Time and time again, I go into spaces and hear the old adage, I don't want to hire a black engineer. I want to hire a great engineer who happens to be black. I want you to hire black engineers. I want you to hire Latinx coders. I want you to do this because of who they are, because our unique lived experiences shape our work and bring value to our jobs. It is important to recognize that whiteness is a construct that operates, that influences how people work. And what we have in many of our tech spaces is an overabundance of whiteness and nothing to balance it, nothing to bring more to the picture. Value people of color because they are people of color. Set your goals based on the stated needs of populations of color. It is really important if you are trying to create an equitable workspace, that your idea of equity is based on the stated needs of your employees of color. It is important when you are trying to build equitable products, that your definition of an equitable product is shaped on your consumer base of color. Time and time again, I see people only willing to invest time and energy in racial goals that feel comfortable to the white majority. And often they are come nowhere close to what populations of color actually need to thrive. Listen to what people of color have already said. There is an irony in being brought into these spaces for me all of the time because I am keenly aware 
that I do not say anything that has not already been said in your space. I do not say anything that experts in your field who are people of color have already said. I am not saying anything new. I'm not saying anything unique. And it's always a little sad to me that experts from outside of the field have to be brought in to legitimize what your peers have already been saying. Do not reinvent the wheel. Don't go corner your coworker of color and say, oh no, Ijoma said, what is it you've always wanted to tell me? Listen to what has already been said. Read the articles, <laughs> listen to the talks. These issues have been brought up. They've been brought up in your meetings. They've been brought up in feedback. They have been written about in tech articles. It is important that you honor the risk and the work that people of color have put forth to discuss these issues by listening. And finally, always be ready to recalibrate. I write and speak a lot about issues of race. And I find that no matter how long people have been following me, have been supporting my work, there is always a point where I seem to go too far, where I seem to challenge a long held belief that they've had. And suddenly, I am, they're no longer allies to me. I am their barrier. I am wrong. I am a threat to how they see themselves. I have received countless emails, seen countless comments, been told by countless people, don't you know the work I've done? Don't you know the meetings I've set up? Don't you know the books I've read? Don't you know the marches I've been to? And all of this is pushback because I said something that challenged what they were doing. It is important to recognize that in a white supremacist society, the overwhelming messaging that we receive 24 hours a day supports white supremacy. It is important to remember that one book, one talk, 10 books, 10 talks is not sufficient to completely undo the racist programming that we have undergone. It is important to recognize that even the work that I do is shaped by my upbringing in a white supremacist society. And this means that even I will come face to face with where my work comes up short, with where I have been wrong. If you are dedicated to anti-racism, that means that you are dedicated to fighting racism wherever you find it, even in yourself. And that means that you must always be willing to recalibrate. You must always be willing to hear people of color when they say that what you are doing is harming them or is insufficient and figure out what you need to do to do better. There is not a final end goal that we can see right now. Yes, you need to set measurable goals in racial justice. Yes, you need to break those down into workable pieces. But it is important that at any time you be willing to hear where you need to change course. And that is something that is often difficult in corporations where things are so deeply planned, where so much money is often involved. But know that what is at stake are people. And it is always worth it. I hope that you are willing to have difficult conversations on race. I really hope that you are willing to sit and listen to where you may have heard yourself in this talk. I hope that you are willing to be grateful for any of the ways in which your peers of color are willing to talk with you about where you have gone wrong so that you can find out where you can go right. It is really important that we be honest with ourselves and each other about what is happening. Because even if we're not talking about issues of race, racism is still occurring. Even if you're not talking about how you are doing harm, that harm is still occurring. The only way we move forward is by being open and grateful for the opportunities to learn and then doing the work. I have always been impressed with the innovation of tech. I've always been impressed with the opportunities that tech has. 
And I am always shocked at the resistance that I am often met with when we talk about opening up our thinking beyond a white male lens. What can tech be? What can tech be in societies that operate different than the white American ideal? What can tech be to bring people together in full appreciation of who they are? Tech can do so much, but only if we start valuing and seeking out new voices and start prioritizing, finding out what we didn't know. It is important to always stay curious. It is important to always stay humble. And it is important to always stay dedicated to anti-racist work. In this work, you may well find things that make you cringe. In this work, you may find that you aren't as great a person as you thought you were. It is important when you set out to do this work to know what you're going to do with those emotions. It is a natural human emotion to feel defensive when you find that you have done something that has done harm. But it is a selfish place to stay in. It is selfish to insist on pushing back to insist on proving someone wrong. If you want to be who you think you are, and if you want your corporations to be what they think they are, then you look for where you've fallen short and you commit yourself to bridging that gap. It is painful at first, and it's always painful because it's a lifelong learning process, but it becomes easier. It becomes easier because you know that with each step, you are closer to becoming who you really want to be. You are closer to creating the products you really want to create, to having the impact on the world that you always really wanted to have. It is easier to look in the mirror after you've really done those hard searches. Because right now, as a society, we are avoiding looking at our own reflections. And nothing good can come of that. This matters not just because of what we're seeing in the local news, not just because of what we're seeing nationally. This matters not only when there are bodies in the street, not only when we're talking about violent brutality. This matters because the ways in which white supremacy kills people of color in this country oftentimes don't have an easy body count. It's important because we are killed slowly or we are killed fast. We are killed by a thousand microaggressions that drive up our blood pressure. We are killed at traffic stops. We are killed due to the lack of opportunity. It is important to recognize that when we are trying to save lives, and that's what we are trying to do in anti-racist work, that everything we can do to reduce systemic racism in our companies, in our towns, in our schools, will save lives, and every life of a person of color in this country is worth the effort. And so I hope that you will take that opportunity um, to really do that searching work. I hope that if you, when you have questions, that we can address some more specifics, but that is my talk for now. Awesome, thank you so much. Um, I'm moved. It's nice to hear some of the things that I've been thinking and feeling echoed here. Um, we have a number of questions on the Dory, so I hope that we can get to all of them. I think we have about 12 questions in all, and they're pretty deep. <laughs> so I'm just gonna take them from the top, folks. I'm sorry, there isn't a way to see, you know, who's, who's the most recent and who's not. So starting from the top, um, this is a, sounds like a personal story, but a month ago, I was taken off guard by a racist comment and the surprise paralyzed me into not saying anything in that moment. How can I build the muscle to immediately address these moments moving forward? And how do you recommend going back to that past situation and calling it out for what it was? So that can often be difficult. And I would say, I'm gonna give two sets of advice here <laughs> because I think that this matters if you're a person of color and if you're a white person. 
So I'd say first and foremost, if you are a, I'm going to say talk if you're a white person first, just because it's a bit shorter. If you're a white person, you have plenty of opportunities to practice. You just got to hear it because you do hear racist comments all of the time. White supremacy is much more comfortable around you and you may not be open to it, but listen to it. So read up on microaggressions, learn what you know, standard things are being said. And when you are in a calm, peaceful place, start thinking about why and how you can address it. A general tip for addressing these issues for anyone who's afraid of getting a defensive response is to think, what is the systemic impact of this racist thing that was said? So a lot of times what happens is, you know something's racist, it hits that chord in you and you're like, oh, that was racist. And then you wanna say, that's racist. And someone says, no, it's not, it's just a comment, just a joke, don't be so sensitive. But there's a reason why you are sensitive to it. You are sensitive to it because it speaks to more than just that situation. Right. So what these jokes, these comments speak to are harmful societal beliefs and practices. Know what that is, know what the impact is, and it's much easier to talk to. That helps in two ways. One, because if you were to say, you know, and I use this example in my book, if you make a joke about black people being late all the time, you can say that joke was racist. And it is, and that can be enough. But if that person wants to push back and say it's just a joke, you can talk about saying, well, did you know that belief that black people are often late means that black people are less likely to be called for interviews? And when we normalize that, it means that we are denying black people jobs with these jokes that you're saying. That is much harder for people to brush off as just a joke. It's also important too, because if you're a person of color being impacted by this, it gives you a center that you can stand in. It helps you remember that you're not overreacting because people will often gaslight you and try to make you feel like you are. But no, this is hurting you and harming you because it is real and that harm is real and that it is important. If you're a person of color facing this, it's important to recognize that you need to do what you need to do to get by. And oftentimes I hear from people of color who have been subjected to racial aggression, to racist aggression, and they feel guilty for the times they didn't speak up. And I don't ever want a person of color who's being subjected to racism to feel guilty for what they do to get by. The truth is, is you're gonna have plenty of opportunities to speak up should you choose to. And I care about your well-being. And so this means that if you have a day where you don't feel safe and you don't feel comfortable, or you just feel shocked and need to sit with it, that's fine. Know that you always have the right to go back to that issue should you choose to. And you have the right to change your mind the next time someone says something and react differently because you are the person trying to survive it. But be, if you are going to go back into that conversation, I recommend that you figure out what you want from the conversation and think if I go and talk to this person, what would be, a, what would be the response I want? Sometimes you just want a response. Sometimes you think, I'm just gonna say it because I have to say it. But think, how do I want them to come back to me? Because if you want them to say, oh, I'm so sorry, oh my gosh, you may not get that. And start thinking about, okay, what could I get out of this conversation that would help me? And so it may not be that. It may be, for me, oftentimes it's knowing that the person that I'm talking to understands that it's at least too big of a pain to keep talking like this. That they may not be sorry, but they may watch their mouth because they don't wanna to have to keep talking to me every time they do something like this. But it's important that I measure what I need to get out of that conversation. So know that before you talk to someone and it will help you because if you don't know what you want out of it and you end up getting rebuffed or you end up being met with defensiveness, you, you can feel used and abused in a way that's even worse than the original comment. And you won't then know how to rectify the situation. Awesome, good advice. This one is a, um, around product. Um, you've discussed how text utopian thinking when designing future often centers white male narratives. What are some ways we can do better, we can better design products and innovation processes to include more diverse perspectives and voices? Well, I would say first and foremost, um, you have to have people of color in the room from the beginning. <laughs> uh, if they're not in the room, I, I, I've said before, it's like baking a poison cake and then thinking you can ice it later and it won't hurt you. Um, 
you got to bake anti-racism into it instead of racism and exclusion. So have people of color in the room, have diverse perspectives. That doesn't mean one person of color. It means think about all of your potential customers, who you are aiming this product at, and make sure they are fully represented in the room. It's important to recognize that people use products differently, that people come together socially in different ways. You know, uh, I am Nigerian American and my Nigerian family uses tech in a completely separate way than Americans do. One of the most inspiring places for me to look at what tech can be is to look at actually how it's being used in many African countries when it's organically being used and not kind of foisted upon them because it's being used to solve many of the problems that white supremacy has created. Yeah. It's being used to bring people together in a place that doesn't actually have infrastructure, physical infrastructure built. It's being used to build community instead of often in America where it's used to aid autonomy. Mm -hmm. And so it's really important that you recognize that people come together differently, that people have different definitions of social, different definitions of safety. It is important to equally value what gives people access and what makes people feel safe. A lot of times when things are based around white men, they think that access equals safety. If it's open to me, it's a safe place. If I can do whatever I want in this space, it's a safe place. If I can make it whatever I want it to be, it's a safe place. That's not safety to people who are disempowered. And so it's important to recognize that your access to a space is limited by how safe you are in that space. And that that definition of safety has to be set by people who have been fundamentally disempowered in all of our spaces. There's, there's an, an add-on to this question. Thank you for that. <laughs> Which companies, institutions, if any, do you think are doing the best job today at integrating and respecting diverse voices and viewpoints in their product development and or hiring? None. Yeah, no, I, I mean, I can say I've honestly never been to a company that has. I've never been to a school that does okay. um, at all. And I, I mean, I've spoken to people who've tried, who've tried things and have failed, who've tried things and been pushed out. I would say you're gonna have to take it piece by piece and take things from outside of the industry as well. Um, one of the coolest things I actually saw um, right now is um, there's a Netflix film coming out called Disclosure. And it's about trans representation in media um, and in film and TV. And it's a super vital film. But the cool thing about this is not only did they center trans voices in this, but it's important to recognize that it's not just about who's on the surface. And I think this is something that tech can learn as well, because oftentimes tech tries to say, if we have this percentage people of color, regardless if they're all entry level, regardless if none of them get promoted, regardless if they're not our products, what if we have this many people of color on the website? As someone who worked in tech, I can't tell you how many times I have shown up multiple days for website re-imaging to be in multiple photos. And I'm like, you guys, they're gonna realize I'm the same black person put on all of these pages, maybe get more black people, right? So this is very common. And so anyways, back to this example I was saying, it's important to recognize that when we talk about diversity in places, even like film, that oftentimes they talk about surface level. Can we get more trans people playing trans characters? That's so important. It's also important that we have trans camera people, that we have trans film writers, right? That we have right. trans people in all of these positions that are often the positions that you get to retire in, right? And so their rule for this job was any, because they honestly were not in a space where there were enough trans people to fill all of these positions because of how excluded they have been from these fields. And because of the financial barriers, the connection barriers that keep trans people out of these fields, there was a requirement for every non-trans person had to have a side-by-side -side trans person with them every step of the way at work. Someone shadowing them, learning from them, and someone that they took input from as well, so that the work they did was shaped by the input of trans people. That's just one creative example of how you can do some real work to try to not only address the product you're developing right then, but to address pipeline issues that stop you from being able to create future products. So it's important to look around and see what's being done in multiple spaces, um, not just in tech, and say, how can we adopt this? Where do we see reflections of this? Because the truth is, is that white supremacy isn't incredibly creative. It operates kind of the same in all spaces. Spaces. So you're going to have to do piecemeal work. You're not going to find one institution that has it because the truth is, is that institution is going to be likely a person of color, that institution. And 
the issue, the things that they're doing are going to be different because they are not going to be addressing some of the barrier issues. They've already addressed those in order to be in the position they're in. So you're not going to actually see that in practice. Thanks. I was, I was put myself on mute. Mm -hmm. um, so we've got the, wow, we've got the sorted, the sorted version. So this one, this question has been upvoted. Um, it could be tempting to offer experiences of sexism as a way to empathize with experiences of racism. Both are built on systemic foundations. Can you please speak to where this juxtaposition is useful and where it is not? Um, yeah, it's never useful. It's never useful. And I, and I, I say this as a black woman. Um, it is, it's never useful and it's a disservice to both sexism and racism to try to do that. Um, intersectionality exists, definitely. And I, as a black woman, was always doubly vulnerable in tech. And I can say this, I have never been more sexually harassed in a workplace than in tech. I have never faced more racial aggression in a workplace than in tech. And it was because I was a black woman, right? I don't believe, honestly, I really truly don't believe that we do a service by trying to translate racism to whiteness in order for it to count because there will always be spaces where it won't translate. There will always be spaces where a white woman will not see herself in what a black person goes through in the office. And you still need that commitment. So that commitment has to really lie in mutual respect. You can say absolutely, you can draw, you can talk about how these systems are connected. You can talk about how patriarchy and white supremacy are connected to ensure that white men stay on top. You could talk about how important it is then that we tackle both. You could talk about how the fact that you can't have anti-sexism work without discussing the ways in which women of color and non-male people of color are disproportionately harmed. Right. It is important to know that you can't talk about issues of race without understanding the particular vulnerabilities that women and non-male people of color face when it comes to racial aggression. But I just don't believe in translating disparate lot lived experiences in order for it to matter. I believe fundamentally in the value of the word of people of color. I believe that us saying this impacts us and it matters should be enough. And I believe that your empathy, if you are a woman or a non-male person who's experienced sexism, should only drive you to listen. You want to be heard if you are a woman because you are a human being who deserves to be heard. You don't want to be heard just only where someone can relate to you. And so, no, I think that oftentimes it is used as a distraction. And I also think that the temptation then to take it so solely into a place that benefits whiteness is too strong. And so we absolutely, I don't think it's necessary. I think it can actually be harmful. Oh, you're muted. Dang on mute. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you for answering that. The next question is, how should we think about the line between speaking up when we see microaggressions that are not directed at us versus giving the victim the choice of whether to speak up for themselves or not? I think there's a couple of things. One, um, look at, always be aware of the end goal, right? Your goal should be to create a safe and healthy environment for the people of color to, to thrive. And so how you speak up matters. So saying, you know, how dare you, that's the worst. I can't believe you would do this to this person. And putting a spotlight on someone who may not want the spotlight on them is not creating a safe environment for them. What I recommend is, a, you should never be a part of why racists are comfortable being racist. Always make racism uncomfortable, but you can do that in a way that follows the lead of people of color and doesn't put people of color in the spotlight. So maybe it's offensive to you that something is racist. Maybe it's offensive to you that someone felt comfortable saying those things in front of you. That's a good way to make it about collective morals instead of you would be okay with this if there was, if this person wasn't here. And so always follow someone's lead and then check up with that person and make sure they're okay and ask what support they need. If the person of color in the space does speak out, back them up. 
back them up strongly, but don't make it your battle. <laughs> don't make it about your emotions, back them up. But if it seems like that person is uncomfortable, if they're the only person of color in the space, then make it a, then then actually make it offensive to you and it should be offensive to you. And that's a really, it is important to recognize that white supremacy will exist as long as it is tolerable to whiteness. So long as white people feel comfortable in white spaces being racist, you have to make it uncomfortable, but make it uncomfortable only for the perpetrator and not for the person of color who's already been impacted. Ooh, man, so good. Uh, okay, this, is, this one is near and dear to Exer. So apologies for those who are on the line from other organizations, but I think you will get the sentiment of this question. X as an organization celebrates failure as a tool for learning. Your book talks about learning to fail in conversations on race. Could you please offer suggestions for ways to make sure we're learning as we fail in these conversations? What does it mean to fail well? Mm -hmm. I would say it's absolutely important, first of all, that you recognize the importance of the conversation itself and that you recognize that a good failure in a racial conversation is only one with which A, the people of color you are talking to are not harmed, and B, where you are learning and committing to better action. A real failure that is unacceptable is one where you learn nothing or you learn at the expense of the safety and humanity of people of color. Every conversation, all of our efforts in anti-racism should be based in affirming the humanity and dignity of people of color. And so it is really important that you know what your goals are. Know that you're, know what you want to get out of these conversations. Know why you're having these conversations. A lot of times what I find is in, in spaces where we're talking about race is that white people wanna just have these free for alls. We'll just get together, I'll say something offensive, you'll say something offensive, and then the middle will come out. And what you're doing is you're playing with people's lived trauma. Yeah. And you are fundamentally devaluing what people of color have been through to get into that space. And there is no success to be found there. So there has to be success, and that success really does have to lie in the safety and dignity of people of color. And so know what you want out of it. The failure will be, will lie in defensiveness. It will lie in, maybe you're just not ready for what you're hearing. You know, it will lie in that. It will lie in your learning process. But a real failure that's unacceptable is when you decide to recenter whiteness in the face of it all. When you decide that it is worth it to make people of color feel unsafe. And so, it's important to know what your goals are. I think it's just really important to treat these conversations as critical. It is not the type of fun experiment that you have when you're developing a new tech product. <laughs> At the end, it's not, we lost a little money, we lost a little time. It's, I made someone feel fundamentally unsafe in this space. So know what's acceptable failure. An acceptable failure is, we were working towards this goal, I wasn't ready, I screwed this up. You know, acceptable failure is I'm learning. I'm still going to keep correcting where I went wrong. Unacceptable failure is people of color left these conversations feeling used and abused and unheard. And they felt like they were forced to do this for your edification. So it's important to know what an acceptable failure is in racial conversations. Yes. I think it's also unacceptable not to learn. Yes, absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> um, all right, next question. In our attempts to gain understanding of this very complex and institutionalized concept of race matters, how do we show support, uplift for those who have carried the burden of some of these issues of oppression as they work to navigate the workplace and obtain upward career mobility? So this is where it's really important when you are, engaging in your research and your work for how systems of race work, that you recognize where your privilege has contributed to the problem. Your support is not going to be in apologizing to people. It's not going to be in commiserating with people. It's going to be in dismantling your privilege and dismantling the privilege of others. So it's going to be in recognizing, oh, okay, I screwed that up. 
You know, I could have spoken up for that person in this meeting. I could have recommended this person. I could have brought this issue up time and time again. You know, I could have been reading about what issues of race are in, in my company, in my division, in my industry, and I didn't. And this is how I'm going to rectify it. Know what your specific privilege is. So this means know where you have access that people of color do not. And this means not only if you are in a superior position, but know how you're listened to when you raise your voice versus how people of color are listened to. Know what happens when you're in all white circles and how comfortable you can be while not talking about crucial issues of race and recognize that that is a problem that you need to rectify. What I always say is, White people who don't want to recognize their privilege in anti-racist work and don't want to do their work in their spaces of privilege are like when I tell my son to try to help me find something I've lost. They say, can you help me? And he says, okay. And then he follows me everywhere I go and looks in the exact same place I just looked. Sorry. <laughs> and then every time I turn around and try to look somewhere else, I bump into him. And when I get frustrated with him, he says, I'm trying to help you but he's not helping me. What he's doing is existing in the exact same spaces I'm already doing the work and ignoring all the little places his tiny arms could be reaching in and looking for something I lost and making it harder for me to do what I need to do. So recognize your privilege, recognize where you had the power to do something different and then start doing it. People of color will feel the difference. You won't need to report it back. You won't need to have a big confession. You won't have to do any of that. They will feel the difference when suddenly they're being backed up at meetings, when suddenly the issues they've been talking about are being addressed. They will feel the difference. And so work on how it can be felt versus what you want to do to feel better about yourself. Okay, sorry. It's hard for me to gather myself after you say some things. <laughs> oh, Lord. Okay. Um, so another one. Books like yours. How to Be an Anti-Racist, and White Fragility have been topping bestseller lists recently. Thank you, Lord. Are you concerned about virtue signaling or performative allyship? How can we best translate reading about these issues into action to change these issues and hold ourselves accountable? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, but I think I'm always concerned about that. I, I've been doing this work for a long time, and every room I'm in, I try to be really honest about what I think is the best that can come out of my visit. And I don't think a room full of people are leaving forever changed out ready to do the work, right? I think that there are a large percentage of people who show up so they can tweet out that they listened to me talk and it made them cry. And then they feel like they've done something. I think it is important to recognize that reading a book does nothing, that listening to a talk does nothing, that crying about racism does nothing. If it can't be felt, touched, eat, spend, if if you can't do that, it does nothing. All that it can do is motivate you to take the action, but you have to take the action. Um, I'm always concerned. I am more concerned when people aren't reading the books than when they are. Um, I don't think I feel... When this book went back into the bestseller list over two years after having written it, and my agent called me, I didn't jump with joy and she didn't either. She already knew. She already had sent out a message to the publisher saying, don't send congrats. Don't make a big deal of this. This is a really tough time because the truth is, is that my book is selling because a black man was murdered on camera. And that is devastating. And it, it, it makes me angry to know that that's what it takes for people to pick up a one-on-one -on -one book on dealing with issues of race, right? At the same time, <sighs> I have to recognize it's better than never picking it up. But it doesn't mean that I'm not bitter about it. And it doesn't mean that I don't want to continuously shout, people have to fast forward their efforts. But you have to learn and do at the same time. You can't say, I'm gonna learn, I'm gonna be in a book club, I'm gonna read the whole history, and then maybe five years from now, I'll be ready to do something. I, I, I've been saying lately, think of it as you walked outside and three of your neighbor's houses were on fire. You don't go, I'm going to go learn the history of fire. You think, I'm going to go to the people who are putting this fire out and ask what I can do to help. And maybe tonight, when I have some time, I will read up why things are always on fire so I can help prevent it from happening. But I also have to do the work. And right now, our houses are on fire. And we have a bunch of book clubs. 
trying to figure out what fire is like. And I really need people to be reading for the specific purpose of what they can do right now to make a difference in their communities to fight racism. Okay. I'm going to hold it together for the next four minutes here. You can about to <laughs> cry with that fire analogy. Oh, all right. Um, here's one last good one. Um, and it, it echoes what you just said. It's good to see that people are finally having an open conversation about racial justice, though it was unfortunately at the expense of the loss of many innocent lives. Do you think that the current racial justice conversations that we are having are different from the ones before? And if so, why? I think that this moment is different. Um, I'm not naive enough to say that it means that it will stay different. But yes, um, I think that we are in a unique situation right now. The truth is, is that the only people who have to deal day in and day out with the realities of brutality that black people face in America are black people in America. We're the only ones who can't turn on a TV show and forget. We're the only ones who can't go for a drive and not worry about it. It, it sits with us because it is our lives, because it is con con continuously coming for us. And I think, you know, I was saying this to someone the other day, I feel like this is the first time in a very long time, maybe ever, that white people in America are getting the tiniest taste of what it means to be black in this country. And here's why. We are in a pandemic. And for the first time, many white people have spent every day worried for their own personal health and safety. Every day stretched thin, every day thinking that every interaction that they have with people in the public could be dangerous to them. It is draining, it is harmful, it makes you feel like you can't breathe. And that is what life is like for black people in this country all of the time. And then on top of it, we will still be brutally murdered. And I think what is shocking the conscience of white America is that they are realizing that you can be afraid all of the time, just trying to get by and you will still open up your computer or turn on TV and see someone being brutally murdered. That violent white supremacy doesn't even take a pandemic off. Right. And I think that now they're realizing, does it ever stop? How can we put up with this? And they can't turn on a football game or a baseball game to make it go away. They can't go hang out at the bar with their friends because the bars are all closed. They're forced to reckon with the terror that we live with day in and day out. I don't know if this will last longer than the pandemic. I don't know if white America collectively can hold on to this feeling and let it guide them through to lasting change, but I really hope so because I want white people to understand that what they're feeling right now is every single day of our lives, all of the time, except for the bodies that we see on the TV are ours. And so if you think that this is unbearable for you and unacceptable for you, it should have been so much more than that. When you, if you care about us and truly think of us as human beings for a very long time. And so I think that that's why it's different right now. But because it is situational, I don't know if it will last. I think right now we've just got to try to get as much as we can out of it. <sighs> wow. Um, we're going to end it there because I want to make sure we stay on time for everybody. But um, thank you so much for writing the book for sharing in the space with us today. And I know so many people, I'm, I've been getting pings interrupting uh, <laughs> about how much they, what you're saying has resonated with folks here. Um, and as you mentioned, this is just the beginning. This is not, this conversation is not change. We're hoping that it, you take the action to make change after this conversation, that it's inspired you like it's inspired me to keep going and doing this work. So thank you for your time. Thank you for being here. Thank I wish you, you well. Thanks. Thanks, everybody. Stay safe, everybody.